Sketchpad figures out and solves the problems. Here the rule is collinearity, so that the dashes lie directly over the guidelines below. The Sketchpad was able to solve very complicated problems in real time uh, involving uh, both linear and nonlinear uh, systems of constraints. So it was the first non-procedural programming system and considerably more powerful than the spreadsheets of today. So he's made a hole in the flange, continuously zooms back. Now he wants to make a rivet, and again we see why it's called Sketchpad. He just draws a rough shape, uses the center of the crossbar there as the center of the arc, and then points to the edges and says, I want these to be mutually perpendicular again. Solving that forces the crossbar to change, which forces the arc to change, which gives you a perfectly symmetrical rivet. Right. Uh, so that's Sketchpad. So this was in 1962. So we have UIs today, and we don't see things like this happening. And uh, to create things like this, it's very painful. Like, uh, so what, has, what, what happened after this? Right? And then the web happened, and the web uh, it's basically HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, so UI development in 2014 uh, revolves around these three technologies. So you define structure to a document using HTML uh, and style it using CSS. But when you say style, you, you are really saying a very su a limited subset of what you can define as styling. Uh, then you have JavaScript, which you use to uh, manipulate this uh, mutable data structure called DOM. So it's terrible, right? So even uh, for, a, for a beginner uh, to do a very simple thing, uh, like vertically centering something, it's really hard. You have to go through uh, tons of stack overflow answers, and then uh, you figure out you have to make this div behave, behave like a table, and then this thing inside has to be a table cell, and then you can al align it vertically. So why is this so hard? It shouldn't be. So, so going back to what UIs really are, so UIs can be thought of as a value. So a UI is a value, uh, and there can be a, uh, the value can be generated by a function which takes some data, right? So if you have some data and you want to display it, that's your UI. Uh, so this is, uh, for a functional pro from a functional programming perspective, this is how UI is supposed to be. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Elm. What is Elm, right? So Elm is a purely functional uh, programming language. Uh, it's a functional reactive programming language. So FRP, what is FRP? So FRP uh, is a functional language. So obviously, uh, functions are first class objects. In fact, Elm is purely functional, uh, even though it's not lazy. Uh, so this has a lot of benefits, as we will come to see. Uh, and it's reactive, which means that uh, time varying values are actually first class citizens in the language, right? So we will, uh, we will see what that means soon. So why should you be excited about Elm, right? So Elm makes GUI programming pleasant. So there are no callbacks, no broken stack traces. So in JavaScript, you always have 
uh, callbacks after callbacks and callbacks after callbacks and leads to something called callback hell. It's a well-known problem. Uh, and uh, then you start to use something like promises and uh, they are actually slightly better but uh, you look at stack traces they give and they are completely useless. So, uh, with them you can comp compose view wise functionally uh, like Venkat uh, was talking about uh, functional composition. It's, it's very important, we all know that in functional programming. So, and code ends up looking like data flow. Uh, which is uh, good for reasoning about. Uh, so types encourage correctness. So if your program compiles, you can be pretty sure that a lot of its correctness is proved. Uh, so you get, uh, there's this really cool debugger in Elm, uh, which you can use to go back in time and see what happened, what broke something and stuff. So uh, really cool debugging technology and uh, you get unlimited undo. So this is a consequence of it being purely functional. Okay, uh, so how do you get started? So this is the Elm website, is at elm-lang.org and you can try out Elm at elm-lang.org slash try if you have your laptop open. Uh, please go to this URL and you can type in code and uh, run it. Uh, other than that, there's a, a library.elm.elmlang.org uh, which gives you a list of packages and their doc documentation, even Elm documentation is on, on library and lang. So the Elm platform uh, consists of the Elm compiler, uh, the Elm repl, and the Elm reactor. Uh, so I will be showing these three things in this talk. Uh, and my slides are available at bit.ly slash Elm uh, 2014. And the code I'm going to be using, uh, there's going to be quite a bit of live coding also, uh, is at uh, github slash shashi slash talk. So you can uh, just go check it out. So let's dive in. Um, so values in Elm. Uh, so these are literals. So one is a number, 1.0 is a float. Or, or coded one is, uh, okay, let me open the Elm REPL, right? Yeah. Elm REPL. So one is a number, 1.0 is a string. One is a string. And you have lists. So the syntax of Elm is, very similar to Haskell, uh, even the type system, uh, it's got ADTs, oh, one, two, three. Uh, so this is a tuple uh, with the type, uh, which is again a tuple of types, number, number, string. Uh, so Elm has extensible records, so that's a record. Uh, let's try that out. Oh, okay. Is that enough? Okay, man. Is that cool? So, can you all see it? Yeah, so I have ID, uh, the name is font. And you get a record of type uh, that. So, it's the type is actually a dictionary of type. So, ID is number, name is a string. Uh, so, that's values. So, how do we define functions? So, functions are similar to uh, functions in Haskell. Uh, notice that uh, type annotations use single uh, single columns in Elm as compared to Haskell where you use uh, two of them, all right? So uh, let's define add a, b equals a plus b. So add 9 and 4 is 13, fair enough. Uh, so Elm again has uh, automatic currying. So I can say add 9 equals add 9. And that's a function which takes one number and returns a number, all right? 
So, let us see what add 9 does, add 9 4 okay, sorry ok. Uh, so, that is one way to define a function, Elm has pattern matching. So, uh, some how do you sum over a list, so you use the case statement if, if the list is an empty list you return a 0, if it is something const with uh, another list you return that number plus sum of that list ok. So, the double column is actually the const operator unlike in Haskell. Uh, so, this is an anonymous function, so you can use them uh, where you want to like you can create them where you want to use them. So, this is map which increments each element and n supports uh, point free notation. So, you can define the sum function uh, you defined above like this sum list equals fold l plus 0 uh, and list and you can leave out list because it is it is the last argument in both cases. So, it just becomes a function uh, so sum just becomes a function which takes one argument which is a list ok. Uh, so, that is point free notation. So, how do you display values right. So, to display values there is a built in uh, variable called main you go and set it to some uh, some value which is an element ok uh, which is of a type element and uh, an element is basically a rectangle which can be displayed by the runtime in the browser. So, let us see how that works right uh, ok I have got a list of this is the Elm reactor. So, I have got a list of files here let us go to hello and it says hello world let us look at the code. So, it says main equals plain text so should I change the color here too fine ok. So, uh, so, it says main equals plain text uh, hello world ok. Uh, so, if you look at the type signature it takes a string and gives an uh, gives an element. So, uh, uh, yeah, sure enough you get hello world on the screen and ok I did not open this in ok I will open this in debug mode all right. So, now what I can do is I can say uh, hook on and as soon as I, s I save it gets updated. So, Elm what Elm does is Elm reactor does is it looks for changes in the file and as soon as it finds one it recompiles it and uh, pushes it to the browser. So, um, this is called hot swapping this is also possible because of uh, purely functional nature of Elm and this is way cooler than uh, it looks it looks like right now. So, let us look at how we can print other values all right. Uh, so, we saw this function called as text which takes any any value and tries to print it on the screen all right. Uh, so, that is printing. So, it is right now printing a list uh, I could print say. So, there are markdown literals in uh, in Elm. So, if I say print that oh yeah. So, markdown is actually already an element. So, that is so this is the syntax for writing markdown and as text record that works uh, ok. So, coming back to the story of what a UI is um, we know that a UI is I mean we can think of a think of a UI as a value and it can be a value generated by a function f uh, using some data. So, when the data changes the view should change right. Uh, so, uh, we can we can generalize this to uh, 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 an a reactive UI wherein the view at any given time t is a function of data at any given time t ok. So, when the data updates uh, with a, uh, because of user interaction or uh, say time is moving or uh, uh, because some missile launched uh, the view should do. So, Elm has this data type called signal. A signal is a time varying uh, a signal takes a type parameter a and signal a is a time varying value of type a uh, which can take values of type a ok. Uh, so, and there is this most primitive uh, operator on on signals it takes a function which goes from a to b and a signal of a and returns a signal of b. So, you can guess what it is doing basically taking the signal for every update to that signal it applies a, a function f and returns a signal whose whose values will be this 
the result of applying f all right so let's look at some uh, signals so example signal all right so i'll open this yeah so uh, this is the window dimension so i can go here and resize my window and it updates Uh, so what I'm doing here is so I didn't I didn't tell you about this prefix operator. It's basically lift. So it's the same thing. Uh, that works. So let's look at some more of these signals. So there's mouse dot position, which is the current mouse position. So as I move my mouse, so notice that I didn't reload the page. Uh, the code got hot back. And then uh, uh, you have keyboard dot arrows, keyboard dot arrows. So uh, what arrows give you is a record of type uh, of type x and y that floats. So if I press the left button, it's going in the negative x direction. Increase the font size. Yeah. Sure. Which takes, yeah, returns a signal of elements. So here, unlike in the previous case, main is of the type uh, signal of element. Okay, so Elm Elm runtime can handle main being signal element. So it basically redraws the element. Okay, uh, so so that's. Uh, so if I press the right button, uh, x becomes one. Left button minus one because it's a Cartesian system, and uh, up is y one. Down, and I can press multiple keys, and only two of them get uh, recognized. Is no. So Elm actually uh, has a compiler which compiles to JavaScript, so you don't have to worry about that. No, no. I think there's a long way to go before that can happen. Um, so that signals. So let's see. Okay. So there there are signals uh, which you can derive from time. All right. So there is there is a signal called FPS set FPS. So you can pass it as float floating point value. Uh, there is a function called SPS which to which you can pass any floating point value and it returns a time delta in milliseconds. So this is supposed to be 33.33. 33. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. So it returns the time delta in milliseconds uh, between two updates. Uh, so uh, the the cool thing about FPS is if your program is taking time to render, uh, uh, it will it will try its best to get at that FPS. And if if your program is fast enough, then it will wait till uh, it updates again. Uh, so it's basically like FPS you see in uh, in your games. So if you uh, if you are uh, like the FPS you get at is dependent on the hardware you have. Uh, so that's FPS. I can have every which takes a to a signal of element. So we have this uh, system set up. So let's see. Uh, let's go in pursuit of. These functions which can take data and give you elements, all right? Uh, so, functionally composed graphics. So, what is it? Uh, so, this is a picture from this paper called Functional Geometry by Peter Henderson. Uh, in this paper, they go from drawing a line to drawing this intricate artwork by Escher. Uh, it's called uh, square limit. Uh, so, they basically start by drawing a fix first and then aligning them and uh, do this recursively till they get to this point right so we'll do uh, we'll look at how things like this could be done with them because of the ability to functionally compose ui okay so uh, there's a type called shape uh, which is a geometry uh, it's an abstract mathematical thing uh, and there's a type called path which is a collection of paths so here are some shape producing functions the circle takes a float 
and it has the uh, circle, circle geometry uh, with with that as the radius, with the argument as the radius. And go and take a number of sides and a radius and returns a uh, returns a, a polygon with n sides and uh, and that radius. Okay, uh, and there is of course square polygon rectangle and stuff like that. Uh, and path is basically a function which takes a list of points and returns a path. Okay, so we will. So these are just abstract shapes and paths. Uh, and they do not have any uh, manifestation in the real world. So to do that, we have to fill them with, with color, or you know, uh, uh, stroke them, stroke their edges, or something. So, so these are functions which. Uh, uh, so there's a type called form, which is a thing that can be drawn inside a collage. Uh, so forms lend themselves to uh, styling, grouping, and 2D transformation. So Filled is a function which takes a color and a shape and returns a form. Trace is a function which takes a li line style and a path and returns a form. And group is a function which combines many forms into one. Okay. Uh, so let's look at some code. So th this is still not enough con context to uh, go ahead and draw a thing. So what we, what we need is a surface to draw it on. So that's given by collage. Collage is not actually a type. So it takes a list of forms and gives us a element. Uh, it takes also the dimension. Uh, yeah, That's the triangle. Uh, let's draw a circle. If you have any questions about this work, please go ahead. Yeah. So form is a type. Uh, there's no definition for it. It's a, oh, internally, uh, it's a uh, it's a list of points. Uh, no, it's a set of uh, it's a collection of shape and the style. It's a data type, uh, but the rendering is done by the runtime. So it's like a hidden built-in data type. Okay. Uh, so we have a circle, but it's hiding the triangle. We will add the triangle here. There we go. And I'm going to make uh, and I can okay. So I can keep doing that, but let me tell you about transformations. So you can move a form. And uh, the move function actually returns the form, and you can rotate a form, which again returns the form. You can scale a form, which again returns the form. So I'm going to try and use that here. Uh, Uh, now I can go here and say move and give it a set of coordinates. And I'm going to move, only one of them moves. Um, Okay. Okay. Sure. Sure. So rotate pi by six. Uh, pi by six is the angle. So rotate is a function which takes a float point, which is the angle, and a form. So what we have here filled is a uh, triangle, which is filled with white color, uh, and rotate basically rotates the triangle. And this collage is a collage takes uh, two values. Uh, which are integers, which is the dimension of the collage, and a list of forms, and then draws it on the screen. And it returns an element which Elm runtime can draw. Uh, so move is similar. Move is taking a tuple of coordinates uh, and moving that uh, shape to the
uh, it is taking from the center. Uh, I can, I'll show you that. Uh, I am going to update the dimensions of the color to be 400, 400. Smooth. For what? Take the float uh, form, so ignore the module namespace part uh, and return form and move. Who takes the uh, coordinate, float float, and then move it. What else? Oh, yeah. there is no colon T in this. So anyway, form is this. Uh, so, yeah. form is a type constructor which has float, 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 and then split the form. So this, these are these are internal representations. So let's go back to the slide. Okay, here basically is triangles. So drawing things is not fun without in a functional language. Uh, it's not fun without uh, recursion, right? So what we'll do now is try to draw this thing. So how this works is uh, the Sierpinski triangle is a recursive that. Uh, um, recursive picture in that uh, all the three sub triangles you see there are again uh, CF triangles with one less iteration. Okay. Uh, so, how do you draw a CF triangle? So, to draw an n step CF triangle, uh, if n is 0, just draw a triangle, otherwise, uh, draw a n minus 1 step triangle in, in, the, in each of the three sub triangles in, in the given triangle. Right. So, we will see this in graphical form. So, when n equals 0, you just draw a triangle. Uh, if it is not, then you go to these three places and draw a CFM state triangle with n minus 1 uh, and h by 2, which is height divided by 2 instead of its original height. So, we will go back to the So, I have a scaling factor for the height because it is the height of a equilateral triangle and I have a function which, uh, which should generate the triangle given a given a edge length and this is done using a path which takes three uh, which creates three points uh, the vertices of the triangle uh, the core, uh, yeah. and I have the CRPNC Sierpinski's function, which takes the center where the Sierpinski's triangle has to be drawn, and the uh, edge length and the end, which is the number of iterations. If n is zero, then I just uh, draw a triangle and move it to x comma y. Okay, and if it's not, then I draw these three triangles. Okay, and group them into a single form so that I can recur. Uh, so these, so the most difficult part of this is. Getting these right. So these are the coordinates of the new triangles, and the rest is just uh, you're going to say uh, you draw these triangles with uh, with edge length a by two instead of a, and uh, iterate n minus one times. Uh, so that's all there is to it. And uh, finally, I'm going to uh, draw a collage here uh, with 400 into 400 dimensions and. Uh, Triangle with, with a with a uh, with a dimension 300. So I'm actually lifting this function which generates a element uh, with the count of mouse click. So every time I click the mouse, the count updates increments, and you uh, get one more iteration in the CFNC triangle. So let's go back and check this out. So right now it's, uh, the count is at zero. So it's just drawing a triangle. A triangle. I click one. It's drawing n minus uh, so n equals zero on three places. And I click again, again, again. Yeah. Okay, what? Yes. 
But you can make it lazy in that. Uh, so there's a keyword called lazy, which will make the tier print key function lazy, and then it won't. Yeah, it's actually creating the entire tier print key triangle again. Okay, so layout. Let's go to the debug mode of layout. So I have got these four boxes. I have a function which takes a color and a, a string and draws a box with of that color uh, and width and height 100 100 uh, so i am actually creating a list of these elements these boxes and i say flow to the left boxes so uh, i'll just start off with right so that we are all we read from left to right so this is easier to understand so that's a b c d so these elements are flowed to the right and left. Yeah. So float, uh, flow, or uh, yeah. So this is flow. Yeah. Flow takes the direction and a list of elements and aligns them in that direction. It returns an element with these elements aligned in that direction. Okay. Uh, and the direction can be up, down, left, inward, or outward. Can stack one, uh, stack these elements on top of each other. Also, yes, sir. So these are canvas elements. These are canvas. Uh, there is a canvas stack here because I'm actually drawing a collage. Uh, you could have markdown instead. Let me show that. Markdown literal. And if I look at the no canvas. Um, so that's um, so I can do more, right? I can recursively uh, have flows inside flows. Yeah. SVG. Uh, there is a D3 backend. Uh, so there is a D3 library which you can use to generate SVG, but I have not looked into that. Yeah, so they uh, they've already done it in a way with a very nice API. So you can take a look, look at that. So I can nest these things, right? I don't know. So I don't know. Uh, maybe I'll do this. I'll load these boxes left. Down. So what I need is That so I have a flow inside a flow. Uh, so I can keep doing this like forever, and you have arbitrarily complex layouts coming out of it. Uh, let's call this something else. Yeah. 
yeah uh, i will come to that in the rest of the talk Problem with light shading, right? Yeah. Just expecting an element. Of oh, I don't actually have to say this. Okay. Now. Okay, let's just leave it like this. Okay, I have a cooler example. Okay. So the cooler example being recursive layer, recursive flows, right? So we all know this uh, thing where you uh, where, where you visually show what half plus one by four plus one by eight so on up to infinity is. So it's one. So we can see that here. So here we have a square, and we are dividing up into halves each time. And these are actually HTML elements, okay, uh, and not not collage, not a collage. Uh, so we are dividing them up into half and flowing them like this. So let's look at the code. It's pretty interesting. Uh, I think it's 20 lines. Yeah. So right now I have a way to draw a box uh, given a width and height. Uh, this returns an element, and I have a way to cut a dimension uh, in a given direction. So this takes a direction and a tuple, so w comma h, and if if the direction is either up or down, uh, it splits the height. If the direction is anything else, it splits the width. Okay. So I have a function called stack here. If uh, so, it takes a dimension um, and a list of directions and n, which is the iterator, um, and iterates n times and uh, drops this thing. Okay. So the main function is just uh, stack stack with a initial dimension and a list of directions it has to cycle through so uh, and the number of iterations right now here we are drawing 15 different elements and they are getting uh, the flow is so let me explain this part so what's happening here is it's flowing in the direction d it's the head of the list of directions it's being passed and it's drawing a box of the given width and height, uh, cut in half, and then stack, uh, drawing a stack, like because it'll be call, calling itself with n minus one. In, and the interesting thing it's doing is it's rotating the list, it's taking this direction and putting it at the end, so that, so that the flow happens first down, and then left, and then up, and then right, and then this keeps cycling till the iterate, iteration stops, right? Okay, so that's layouts. Oh, by the way, this is these are HTML elements. So, anyone wondering? Yeah, 
I wonder how uh, Bootstrap or 960 GS or something like that would do this, right? Okay. <coughs> so there's also uh, for doing layouts, there is this thing called container, which will create an invisible container of given dimensions in chain, and uh, and and place uh, and place an element in that position, and this again returns the element. Okay. And the position can be middle, mid top, mid bottom, mid left, all that. So let me go here and say I want a collage of let's say width and height where I'm taking width and height from the window dimensions. Uh, I will show you how that is done. Window dot dimension so collage this and I will say middle. actually a tuple so, so I'm saying collage sorry it should be container yeah so this is actually in our responsive grid centers it at all times and it's also vertically centered okay uh, okay uh, let's move on to going more reactive right uh, okay so making more signals so there are combinators for these signals uh, one of them is fold p so this is similar to fold r but you fold a signal over time so this is pretty cool. So you can, for example, implement the count function we used before in the share print keys example. Or to impl uh, you can implement a count function using fold p, where uh, uh, where your uh, where your function which takes two arguments, it's just a plus operator, and the initial value is zero, and then you pass it in any signal, you will give, get a signal of int. Okay. Mm. So I will show you this in an example soon. So this is lift two, which is basically lift with two argument functions and takes two signals and returns one signal. So there's lift three, lift lift up to uh, eight. Don't ask you how to do nine. I think you can do them with lift two. Like you can implement lift nine with lift two. I guess. So there's merge. You, you take two signals of the same type and give out a signal. Which updates when either of them update. Okay. There's sample on where you take two signals and up the output signal updates when the first signal updates, but it takes the value of the second signal. So if you look at the type signature, it takes signal A, signal B, and gives the signal B, which updates when signal A updates. Okay. Uh, so there are other things, keep if, which takes a predicate and a signal and drop, I mean, keeps only values which satisfy that predicate keep when which takes a signal of boolean and another signal and keeps the updates only when the uh, first signal is true and drop if and drop when are basically inverse of that and drop repeat which, drop, which drops repeated updates and count and count if which we saw uh, count if takes a predicate and then count if. Uh, so let's go back here zero nine mouse click So I'm opening this here. So this is just my mouse coordinates right now. So now what, what I want to do is sample mouse position on mouse click. Okay. So I have a last click variable here, which is sample on mouse dot clicks. Mouse dot clicks is again a inbuilt uh, signal which is coming out from the runtime, and I take mouse dot position at each mouse click. So if I now plot, I mean, if I now print last click after lifting, so I get the mouse position. Okay, wherever I click, so I'm clicking. You can't see. Them. Uh, so let's now try to create a list of points that I have clicked on. Right. Uh, so I have 4P here, where I, have, I am 
using a concat operation as the function that called ptex and starting out with the empty list and just combining all clicks into a list of clicks all right so let us see what happens if I save this oh. yeah so it already had those things in memory like uh, my previous clicks in memory and it was actually creating this signal and updating it now that I swapped out the uh, thing that is being displayed it is actually showing the list it has collected so where did the D come from? So that works. Uh, if you come here and look at the debugger, so it's actually recording all my events. Okay, so I click a few times and then go back here, pause it. I can roll back. Okay, I think this is pretty cool. Okay, uh, now let's. I'll show more of this. Let's go back to. Uh, so I have a program here uh, called stamps. What it does is it just draws some random uh, figure at at a uh, at give at a at different places in the screen. Okay. So right now I have three points. That's because I've passed it a list of points. These three points are being drawn over there. So this a stamp is being drawn on these three points and the stamp takes uh, width and height of the collage and uh, x and y coordinates and draws something there. So by the way this operator is just function application instead of having nested calls you can use this to reduce the number of parentheses. So what this does is uh, it takes n gone 330 and applies fill this this function to to it and so on up so on up to the last move call. So I am just mapping over stamp and uh, drawing all the points. Okay. So now what I can do is get these signals from the other file and just replace this uh, the list of points with some variable called points and say PDR this and say list and say points and what happens is now I have a place where I can click okay. Mm, so you can actually make this code more pretty by just removing these things and using this I like it this way. Uh, so if you go here and see it is still recording all of my events so I can roll back to any point in time and then start the program again and I can rewrite it too. So I think that is pretty cool too. Yeah. Okay. So the, then we have an example of a bouncing ball which operates on time varying signals. Um, so this is again 28 lines of code. Uh, so the main function is just lift draw ball. So this is how it's supposed to be. Draw is our UI function, and ball is our data. And so we have a function called step, which takes the time and the ball, and steps the ball to the next time step. Applying some kinematics here. Uh, so the cool thing about this is that I can go here and vary gravity. It gets hot wrapped. Wait for it. Yeah, I don't know why that is happening. Oh, that's bounce velocity. Ah, so that's just some trick where uh, you basically reverse the uh, thing you are doing. Okay. So if ball's height is less than zero, then bounce velocity. Otherwise, you reduce the velocity by minus one. 
So, a ball is what is a ball? Uh, a ball is a type uh, with these two this is the type of the ball and this is a this is the initial ball whose height is 0 and initial velocity is bounce velocity these two are global variables. bounce velocity is, is a global over there. So, so fold p takes the initial ball and steps uh, as uh, as and when the FPS changes okay. So, this is a signal uh, that is the initial value steps is the function which steps steps through time okay. Uh, So, now I pause the thing, I can go back, change the gravity and see how it, how that affects it. Uh, Let us look at a cooler example, yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, so your database has to be uh, so basically, these events get recorded and replayed. So that's how it works. It's replayed from the beginning. Even if you go to this point, it replays from the beginning, and it's it, uh, Elm Reactor actually ca caches the last hundred updates. Uh, so I guess the database record will be added again, unless you have some mechanism to like uh, fake the database database updates and. Moreover, when you are debugging, you should not be doing that. Yeah, so signals are the only way to do side effects. So, we can actually like simulate signals and uh, record them somewhere else instead of the database. So I will come to that. There is something called ports which you can use to communicate with the outside world. Um, Let's look at the Mario example, right? Mario. Okay, this is the this is Mario. Uh, so I have uh, his his path is being traced here. And this is actually a function uh, in the debug module which you can use to trace anything and I am watching its velocity and uh, the arrows. So, while he is doing this uh, I feel that the gravity is not quite right. I can go back to my wire code and update some gravity here, make it 5. So, if you did not notice, I will do it again. Uh, so, it actually draws his path that would have been ok. Um, so, you can actually send him back and start over with a new gravity. So, I think this is very useful when you are making games, yeah. Uh, what do you mean 10 browsers? 10 browsers connected to the same uh, reactor? Uh, what do you mean 10? Yeah. Yeah, it is not really a thing you want to be using in production, I guess. Uh, so, sometimes hot swapping fails because there is some variable that you have destroyed and something else you are using. And oh, actually, it fails when you have a intermittent compile error or something like that. Um, Yeah, so I will be covering how to embed L maps inside your JavaScript application and how to communicate with JavaScript. Um, yeah, okay. 
so interactive UI elements. So you want to be able to have check boxes, text boxes, and stuff like that. And yeah, you get functionally composing these things also for free. Okay. <coughs> We go back to the reactor. Yeah, checkbox. So, how do you create checkboxes? So, there is this type called input in ELB, uh, which has two things inside it. One is a signal, and one is a handle. And the way I find most useful to think about an input is the handle goes into something in the runtime, and the runtime can use that to update the signal okay so in this case uh, this in the case of a simple so this is the type of the type input so the type is actually a type alias with type input a is a combination of signal and a handle uh, so there is this function called input given an initial value it generates a, a value of type input a uh, so, looking at a more concrete example, uh, so I have a input called check, which is which defaults to false, and then now I can draw connect it to a checkbox in the runtime by saying checkbox take this handle and apply this function on the update and uh, give it a default value that is supposed to show in the beginning. So this, so if you look at the diagram. So the handle is connected to the checkbox, and every update the checkbox is making goes through a lift on S, and then the signal comes out. Okay, uh, I will go back and show you an example. So here is check. So we are starting off with a false value, and here is the checkbox which takes check dot handle and takes an identity function. I don't want to be changing true to false, I mean true and false or anything else let us say and false as the default value and let us see how this works. Okay. So, so I am actually printing the value of the signal. Uh, so, this is a lambda which takes a value v and puts it in uh, puts it next to the checkbox. Um, so, it's doing that. So now, let's say I want to say yes or no when the checkbox changes. I can do that easily here. This fetch, then yes, uh, no. So now the signal is actually a signal of string. Complicated examples. Ah, this is not that complicated, but yeah. So this is how you do uh, text box input. So this is an app which has a text box. Oh no, sorry. This is so. This is an example which shows that you can sync these input elements also. So. go back to this example and remove the signal thing. Oh, you cannot put it in a collage, sorry. A collage, so here I am doing it. Okay. The checkbox is in a flow. Oh, okay. Middle of a 300 into 300. 
Ah, that's because I'm using as text, so I can just say plain text and it will make it. Uh, that that prints the literal. Okay. Uh, there you go. Uh, so we go back to this example. So here, I can actually lift my checkboxes with a different default value taken from another signal. So, in this case there are three boxes, they are all synced because a box is taking this, this variable called east checked as its default value and east checked is uh, an argument to this function called display boxes and my main function is basically display boxes uh, with the default value being whatever the signal value is right now. Okay. So, that is how they all get synced. So, this is an app which takes uh, as is that okay? Oh, right. right. Okay. Uh, so, this is an app which just reverses the string. So, I will go back and let us look at the code. Um, So, these primitives are actually defined in these two modules, so we will have to import them. Uh, so, a text input uh, gives a, a signal of type content and content uh, has two things, it is the text of the input and the selection, the current selection uh, from where to where is the text selected. Okay. So, here there is a bunch of code to like extract out just a string from the content and reverse it and display it as a, as a plain text, so that is about it. Okay, uh, let us move on in the slides. So, there is a school new library called Elm HTML. Okay. So, so, so far we saw uh, things which are which were like done uh, using Elm primitives, but you want to be able to tap into the enormous amounts of uh, CSS that others have written and uh, whatever boot, uh, libraries like bootstrap or whatever. So, you want to be able to create HTML elements, um, like raw HTML elements and manipulate them. So, this is a library that would let you do that. It is uh, written by Ivan, uh, Ivan Zaplitsky, who is also the author of Elm. Uh, so, so there is a function called load which takes a string, which is a uh, which can be div p or something like that, which is a tag name, uh, and a list of attributes, and list of CSS properties, and a list of HTML children, and returns an HTML. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. I'm not going to go too much into the code of this in the interest of time, but we will look at a concrete example. Uh, so there's a there's a famous benchmark called uh, to do MVC which all MVC JavaScript MVC frameworks use to like benchmark benchmark themselves and this is how it looks. Mm, Let us say mm, task 1, right. Uh, so all that works and this is about 300 lines of And the thing about this code is that it is uh, strongly typed and, and you can compose things functionally. So, say I am sure there is a map function here which takes there are a lot of map functions. Yeah, to do item it takes a to do it takes a task and returns an HTML. Let us look for map to do item. So, filter visible task. So, this is pretty cool. You can't, I mean, it is very nice to be able to write code like this when you are designing UI. So, you just say filter all visible tasks and then map them over to do item and you return a HTML element and that becomes a children of 
your parent element which is the suction. Okay. Uh, so this is, this is a function which takes a uh, list of tasks and returns the HTML. So, what is another cool thing about this is that you get uh, since it is a purely functional language you can implement these data structures as uh, immutable uh, under the hood and what you get is you when your view changed you have a different view uh, you can actually diff the view and apply it to the ROM. Okay. So, it turns out like redrawing the entire uh, scene it is quite expensive and so is uh, so redrawing the scene is quite expensive because uh, there will be a lot of uh, bookkeeping the browser has to do. So, you, what you can if you could instead do is uh, just go to the particular element that you want to change and just do that. Uh, so, there is this library called virtual DOM written in JavaScript. Uh, so, Elm taps into that uh, to do this. Uh, so, when you have two views you can basically dip them and patch it to the DOM. So, what, what does this entail right. So, apparently this is extremely fast compared to uh, the most popular JavaScript MVC framework fast mode Ember, Angular, React, Ohm. Uh, Elm is only slower than Mercury and Elm's uh, virtual DOM is like taken from Mercury. Okay. Uh, so, this is actually Elm is actually faster fastest in Firefox. The ports, uh, so that's, that's uh, doing HTML in it. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about ports now. So ports uh, are a way to communicate with the external world. A port uh, is basically a signal, uh, a special type of signal. Uh, the external world can update the signal if it's a input port, or M can give out signal to the uh, external world if it's a output signal. Okay, so this is how you define a port. So port is a keyword. Port uh, message in is a signal of string. Port message out is a signal of string. Uh, then you assign message out, uh, assign any signal of string to message out, and it just goes to the browser. So how do you take it out in in the JavaScript end, right? So you can go to uh, the HTML and generate, or you can write your own HTML and do this. So, there is a when you have the Elm runtime in your uh, page, there is an object called Elm uh, which has these uh, methods. So, here we defined a module called chat and that turns up as Elm.chat. So, you can embed that in a div, the chat app in inside a div and then assign a initial value to the port over there. So, message in was the port that we created, third line. Uh, and this is how you send a message to the port, send hey, and the signal updates. Uh, and you can subscribe to any output signal like message out, uh, pass in a handler, and you can handle that in JavaScript. So, if, if the user types in some message in the Elm app, you get it, you get it over here. Okay. Uh, so, let us now go check out one more example called Shanghai. It is a so in Shanghai dot Elm, I am just printing this data structure called doc. So, doc uh, keeps, a, keeps track of the ships in the dock and, the, and their capacity. Uh, so, let us go to the reactor Shanghai. So, all this code is uh, uh, online. I encourage you to check it out. So, I am sending a ship called Fukon's ship with that, that much capacity and it is getting updated. So, that this thing is an L map, this, this part is an L map, and the out, outside part is an HTML that you can write. So, this is the source code of this. So, we have included the Elm runtime and then Shanghai.js which is generated by Elm compiler. So, so that is 
how you can then this will compile this shanghai.js and this including that and finally it has a id called container and inside ports.js which is again a user written javascript code to connect element uh, javascript so over here what i'm doing is elm.embed uh, take this module called elm dot shanghai, put it in this div, and these will be my initial values of the of the ports. Okay. So let's send one more ship. Uh, so elm is actually sending <coughs> sending the total capacity of the uh, of the port uh, of the Shanghai dock right now. Uh, like when a ship uh, arrives at a dock. The capacity increases. So, if you look at the M code, uh, the total capacity is a port which is coming to the browser, and the way it's getting handled is it's being printed on the console. So, when I add one more ship with a different name, and the capacity increases. So, now I can say outgoing ship and tell it that hook on, hook on ship 3 left the dock, so I will remove, remove that from the dock. Okay. So, okay. yeah that is that and FRP is the new MVP. Right? Uh, so, all, all of this code we wrote so far, we saw so far can be divided into these three uh, simple modules called models. Uh, for example, in the Mario, uh, let us go back to the Mario example. Uh, So the three three divisions are model, update, and display. Mo model is the model of your app, like the structure of your app uh, in terms of a data structure. And update is a function which takes your current current state and some input and updates the state, and returns a new state. Basically. And display is something that that displays uh, some given data. Yeah. So, model. The model consists of Mario's x y uh, x y position, x y velocities, and the direction is moving in. So, direction can be left or right. Uh, so, the entire thing is the model, and this Mario is the default model. So, he's at zero zero zero. In the, at the beginning, and the step uh, takes the time delta dt, and the key is being pressed, and updates Mario. Okay. Um, using all these helper functions, so that's the update part, and the display part uh, uh, displays uh, has the function to display the entire scene with the uh, inside a container of w dash dash with the given value so, and main is just take display uh, display uh, this signal which is which is uh, stepping Mario to the next Mario given some input and drawing it in this in these dimensions window or dimensions like in the entire screen basically. So, I think this is a cooler way of the, uh, dividing your application in terms of functionality. Like, uh, there is division of labor uh, and you can contain modularity and all that. So, uh, okay. How much time? Okay, I have like five minutes left, four minutes. So, let me go and show you some cool things that people are doing. So, these are uh, examples on the M website. So, this is WebGL, so that is a rotating 3D thing. So, there is a, a WebGL library in Elm. Uh, this is actually a lot of fun to play with.
now you can there's a FPS. So that's the first person shooter game. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So there's a. No, you can embed an Elm app inside a div and have ports which communicate to some JavaScript and the JavaScript uh, functions which it communicates to will be responsible for communicating with the server. Actually there is a uh, Ajax library in Elm, I did not go into that. Either. So if you want to look at uh, uh, all those things just go to the Elm website slash uh, examples dot Elm. And there is a bunch of examples which goes from basics to intermediate to bigger projects. What? Uh, so, so, the Ajax library is actually like a built in, so it does not actually use ports, but the runtime takes care of it. Uh, okay, so runtime uh, come again yeah so basically l programs compile into html css and javascript so you can use your favorite web server what plugin i have no idea sorry uh, I actually wrote uh, yeah you can dip deploy the JavaScript code you do not you do not deploy the Elm code because that is meaningless to the browser. Uh, so I actually wrote a bit for Elm Meteor uh, Elm to Meteor uh, so there is one example. So I, back then like I did not know a lot about uh, port this was like uh, six months ago. So this is the test code uh, which is like 30 lines. What this does is uh, it takes a signal of mouse clicks and sends it to Meteor uh, which gets stored in a MongoDB database and then you have meteor.com. So and it takes the points back from the database and draws it on the screen. This is enough, uh, okay. this is enough, uh, you know, uh, gluing together for it to become a colla collaborative app. So, a lot of people have used this apparently. Uh, so, I am opening an incognito window. I will go here. Uh, that big circle just represents where I clicked last. So, when I click on this, you see it appear on the other window. So, I will just click here, just watch that space. So, that is right below. Okay, you see that. Anyway, uh, so I click here, click here, click here. Uh, so, I am clicking here, just find the same spot in the other one. So, it appears there. So, this thing, and this is like 30 lines of code, and it has sessions. So, which means that uh, my previous position is stored here, the circle represents that and here it is a different circle. Okay, anyway, like this is a, this is not that cool an example, but it works. Uh, so, apart from that, okay, uh, yeah, so I guess we are at the end of the talk. So, there is a Google group called Elm Discuss, you can go there and so one thing I did not talk a lot about is the extensible records. The records we saw are, are typed and you can change the type in, in your various functions. Uh, you can extend, add, add attributes to it. So, I am over time right, uh, okay, cool. so I am Shashi and that is my Twitter handle, that is my 
and get up the uh, get up Joel. Yeah, sure. Oh no, I'm afraid. So, uh, uh, so semantically, uh, that semantically Elm is not equal to Haskell in that Elm is eagerly evaluated. And Haskell is lazily evaluated. One thing, and, uh, Elm's compiler is written in Haskell, and it has nothing else to do with Haskell apart from Elm, apart from syntax being very similar. Uh, So, Elm compiles to JavaScript. Yeah, so there is uh, there is some work on this. Uh, so, there is uh, JSGSC, I think. What's it called? GSC, yeah. GSC, which compiles to JavaScript. Pure script, yeah. Pure script. And there is Hack, that's the Facebook language. And there is Helm, which is like Elm implemented in. Okay. So, there are some uh, very good ideas you can steal from Elm. So, uh, in my work, I basically do that day in day out. Uh, so, this is Elm. Uh, yes, I can see on this. So, this is a gaming engine which copies Elm basically. Uh, so, th some things I built with by stealing this. So, I work on Julia. Uh, uh, at my day, day job, and I work on creating interactive user interfaces for people who do not want to care about, say, uh, event loop or callbacks and stuff. So they just want to be able to create easy, uh, easy interfaces that they can play around with. So these are uh, these are scientists and mathematicians. So uh, Julia is a technical computing language, so you can do things like this with this much code and there is also okay, that takes some time anyway. So people are actually using this stuff uh, for uh, teaching and all these purposes and the way I did this is basically I made a library called reactive uh, which is which is which implements Elm's signal in Julia, and then uh, there's a library called Interact, which adds syntactic sugar to left operations. So you go manipulate, add manipulate, and then a for loop, and then you have something in the middle, and that updates. So the for loop becomes a set of widgets. Okay, uh, so that's my talk. Uh, thanks a lot for listening.